welcome everyone and happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Uh, this is a day again for and with our children, our youth, to take a stand with them, to learn uh, among each other and to re-solidify ourselves for the, for the very urgent mission that we have to make sure that all children have an equal access to the, the current and futures that they all deserve by not being exposed to harmful environmental hazards. So we are so honored to always have this time on Children's Environmental Health Day where we award some amazing leaders, leaders who are every single day working on behalf of all of us and especially our most vulnerable. I would also like to take uh, a minute and begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So we're gonna go ahead and get started here and we are going to uh, award each of our panelists first. They'll be giving a few remarks and then we'll have our combined discussion. And we very much look forward to all of you submitting your questions or you know, also uh, um, having a way to engage here as well. Our first award recipient is Dr. Gradia Huerta Montañez. And I had the pleasure of meeting Gradia a few years back uh, when we were at a neurodevelopmental uh, forum, also trying to break the systems of children's young brains being impacted by harmful chemicals. She is a pediatrician consultant of the Puerto Rico Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention and Surveillance of Blood Lead Level in Children of the Puerto Rico Department of Health and is the Puerto Rico liaison for the Region 2 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. In addition to her clinical experience, Dr. Huerta Montañez has led NIH-funded research studying neurodevelopmental impacts to infants and children in Puerto Rico from prenatal environmental exposures, and she has also collaborated with and advised federal agencies around children's environmental health issues. She is also ensuring that our next generation of pediatricians and healthcare workers have a solid understanding of how climate change impacts children's health. She teaches a class on climate change and health at two of the medical schools and as well as pediatric residency programs on the island. And on behalf of CEHN, I'm honored to award you with our 2022 Child Health Advocate Award in Science. Congratulations. Oh, I think you have to take off your, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. It is a profound honor. Um, thank you, Ense. And it's a profound honor to be here with all of you to celebrate the calling of children's environmental health and be inspired by my fellow attendees and further our commitment, uh, for, uh, fellow awardees, I'm sorry, and further our commitment. Um, there is mounting evidence in positive psychology research suggesting that being grateful is strongly associated with greater well being and happiness. Stronger relationships improves mental health, physical health, and a fortified capacity to deal with adversity. But despite all of the advantages of tapping into gratefulness, some days it seems we can't stop worrying, working, problem solving, and producing. Our baseline is pervaded by a continuous need to hurry and multitask. And I believe that happens to all of us sometimes. So um, this day can leave us with little time to take stock of the gifts, large and small, that we receive every single day. When I read the message from CHN notifying me about this estimated award, I ran to my husband in disbelief and enthusiastically shared the news with him and my children. And after I came to my senses, I was completely overcome with a feeling of gratefulness, not only for the recognition, but also for the people in my life, including those who are not with us anymore, for the countless opportunities to grow as a person, a wife, mother, and an advocate and professional. And it was an expansive and peaceful feeling that I will treasure um, forever. And this award came with a hidden bonus because to write these remarks, I was forced to pause and reflect and realize that this year marks a decade of my career path in pediatric environmental medicine and public health. It has been 10 years since my husband, who knows how passionate I've always been 
about everything related to the environment, told me about a job opportunity as a contractor supporting the CDC. And that is how an emergency room pediatrician became a case manager of a cluster of children with lead poisoning. That assignment was the starting line of this journey in which I have received the gifts of trust, time, companionship, and sustained friendship from so many. I'm also grateful for the gift of compassion from occasions someone helped me see my shortcomings, allowing me to reflect, amend, and learn. Prior to the report about this cluster of lead poisoning, the prevailing view in Puerto Rico was that there was no risk deriving from lead. But in 2011, over 50 children whose fathers worked at a virus recycling plant were identified with lead poisoning. The joint interagency investigation revealed that the fathers inadvertently were bringing lead to their homes in their clothing, shoes, and cars. They were unaware of the risk or occupational safety measures that could be put in place. There was lead dust in the infant's cribs and car seats, in the living room sofas, in the carpets, in the children's toys. It was heartbreaking to talk to these fathers and another stark example of the social determinants of health. And like this, I have encountered many examples of environmental injustice in Puerto Rico. I'm happy to say that perseverance goes a long way. And with the relentless support of Dr. Cindy Calderon, a fellow pediatrician, and the work of Dr. Wilmari Muniz, our efforts led to the establishment of a surveillance system for elevated blood lead levels among children in Puerto Rico, thanks to funding from CDC. And this surveillance system is up and running, and now we're working very hard to improve the compliance with lead screening among children here. I'm grateful to the Region 2 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit for their unwavering support of so many years. PESO, along with Drs. Phil Landrigan and Jose Cordero, supported the Pediatric Environmental Health Training Program that afforded me and other four fellows the opportunity to train for this career path in children's environmental health. PESO has done very significant work to improve pediatric environmental health on the island through multiple projects, including bringing CHN Eco Healthy Child Care Program to Puerto Rico, increasing the capacity of child care personnel to prevent environmental exposures in their centers. And I truly appreciate their efforts to develop health prevention sources that are culturally and linguistically competent to many populations. I'm particularly beholden to Drs. Perry Sheffield and Maida Galvez, who have been extraordinary mentors, accessible and enthusiastic to support our ideas and efforts. And I admire their generous work and commitment and value their friendship. And please take note, now more than ever, the work of the PESUS network is essential to improve children's health outcomes across the entire United States. I'm grateful to Martha Berger, Ruth Edsel, and present and past members of the EPA Children's Health, children's health Protection Advisory Committee for allowing me to serve alongside this group of extraordinarily smart professionals who collaborate to make sure that children's particular concerns are considered in the development of policies and standards to protect human health and the environment. The work of these committees is fundamental in ensuring that our children grow, play, and learn in healthy environments. And I also want to underscore the efforts of Carmen Guerrero, director of the EPA's Caribbean Division and her team, and personnel from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Puerto Rico for having children's environmental health integrated into their agenda. One example of this support is the integrated best management and lead prevention efforts in schools. I'm also grateful to the Puerto Rico test sites for exploring contamination threats or so-called PROTECT project for the opportunity to make contributions in the development of knowledge, but also in providing direct services to children and their families. The participation of this Puerto Rico cohort of pregnant women and their children in the NIH Env Environmental Influences on Children Health Outcomes or ECHO program is an example of inclusion and equity in environmental health research. Puerto Rico is considered an environmental justice island with a long history of contamination from industries and governments that have not reliably protected communities and the environment. By helping study environmental contamination and adverse birth outcomes, projects like these allows medical professionals like us, others in the care of the continuum of children and policymakers to have actionable information to better protect pregnant women and children from, from exposures that may lead to adverse pregnancy and children's health outcomes. While working on these projects, I have had the unique opportunity of incorporating the aspects of pediatric medicine into research, including a comprehensive pediatric examination 
following the standards of the American Board of Pediatrics. And this has led to the identification of pr medical problems not previously identified. And through the report back mechanism, hundreds of families in Puerto Rico who participate on this project and are medically underserved have been linked to needed services, have been oriented on how to protect their children from environmental exposures, and if not already, have been connected to a pediatric medical home. My heartfelt gratitude also goes to the American Academy of Pediatrics, of course, uh, their leadership and its fellows for supporting and helping Puerto Rico during these trying times. Throughout hurricanes, earthquakes, and the pandemic, and now the crisis in our healthcare system, AAP has generously provided resources to support our pediatricians, children, and their families. At a national level, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that the AAP gives its fellow to develop as leaders in pediatrics and for supporting our advocacy for policies that protect all of our children in all of their life stages. From the front of academia, I'm grateful and congratulate the UPR School of Medicine and the Ponce School of Medicine for inserting climate change and health into their curriculum for medical students and pediatric residents. They have joined visionary schools and training programs adding this content and lens into their offerings. These efforts will be force multiply, multipliers and foster new leaders. But my most heartfelt thanks are to my husband and my children, Francisco, Gabriel, and Ricardo, the loves of my life and who put a face into the responsibility to create the conditions for a better tomorrow. I want to end by sharing a statement that resonated on me, with me long time ago. A Nobel Prize winner in chemistry said, Science gains its full meaning when it translates into improving the quality of life of all human beings. I am grateful to uh, all of you, uh, and I'm grateful for science, and, and as I said, people like you who labor so that um, science benefits all people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And I have already some great ideas, yes, <laughs> about our uh, discussion and just so many enlightening points you just raised. Congratulations. Thank you. And now we will have the presentation of our policy award. That would be me. Um, thank you, uh, Gredia. Congratulations on a really well-deserved award. Um, our policy awardee today is Dr. Mark Mitchell. Mark is Associate Professor of Climate Change, Energy, and Environmental Health Equity at George Mason University. He is also Director of State Affairs for the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and is Founder and Director of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship, a leadership development program for physicians of color to advance equitable climate solutions. Additionally, he co-chairs the National Medical Association's <clears throat> Commission on Environmental Health and co-chairs the governor's, excuse me, co-chairs the governor's Connecticut Equity and Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Dr. Mitchell has spent over 20 years working in the public health sector, including as director of Hartford, Connecticut Health Department and the deputy director of the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department. He spent 15 years working with environmental justice communities and is the founder and senior policy advisor of the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice. Dr. Mitchell has served on several US EPA and FDA advisory committees, and he is a national advisor for the Healthy Schools Campaign. He actively works to drive prevention of neurodevelopmental toxicity, especially in children of color. We at the Children's Environmental Health Network have been fortunate uh, to work with and to learn from Dr. Mitchell on a number of different efforts over the years. And while he has received a number of awards for his community and environmental health leadership, I think one more very well-deserved award couldn't hurt. So congratulations, Dr. Mitchell, on our policy award. Uh, thank you so much, um, Christy and Nse and, um, uh, and others. Um, I actually remember when the Children's Environmental Health Network was uh, founded 30 years ago. Uh, I remember when NSA came on uh, as the executive director, which has been years ago. And, um, uh, and uh, I am thrilled to be part of the uh, 17th Annual Child Health Advocates Award. 
And I know that I have arrived if I'm on a panel with uh, Doc, with uh, Reverend Yearwood. Um, <laughs> something I've uh, always been hoping to do for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, I was quite honored and quite surprised uh, to receive the policy award from uh, the Children's Environmental Health Network. Um, I was um, pleased that I was able to pull the wool over uh, Christie's eyes and Insay's eyes to actually have them believe that I do things for uh, children's uh, and children's health. Um, uh, I always felt inept with children. Uh, I have no children of my own, and I've always considered parents and teachers to be magicians. Um, <clears throat> Uh, at the Hartford Health Department, I once attended a graduation party of, uh, of 50 two and three year olds uh, from our uh, child development program. I was shocked to see that all 50 were quiet, happy, and well behaved. I knew that I was witnessing a miracle, um, so I had to go to church immediately. Um, but because I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I, and I, I don't have anything to do with children. That's not my uh, forte. My work is focused on environmental justice. My work is focused on climate justice. My concern is health, um, the health of all people, especially for uh, pe uh, people of color and those who are most at risk. I'm interested in humans now and in the future but I'm not interested in children. Um, so what I do has nothing to do with children. I work on environmental justice, climate justice, specifically I work with lead and lead poisoning. I work on asthma issues. I work on chemical exposure. I work on uh, dental amalgam. Um, uh, yes, it's true that, um, that I am concerned about lead in pregnant women and how it crosses the placenta and bioconcentrates in the placenta and then go, well, I guess it does go to children, right? Um, and then there's lead dust and everybody's exposed to lead dust, but uh, I'm most interested in those who are at risk. Um, and I guess that's the children. Um, but but uh, but I'm not really interested in children. Uh, I am interested in asthma and in uh, exposures and in chronic conditions. I got asthma when I was in my 50s. Um, and I, you know, and asthma affects everybody. Uh, and I'm also interested in the research about asthma, about how what causes asthma. And so it seems like there are exposures during the prenatal period that cause um, little people to be susceptible uh, to asthma. But 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 I don't do anything with children. Um, so I am interested in. Uh, uh, chemical exposures and people who are most at risk of chemical exposures, uh, particularly uh, psychosocial stress. Uh, people who are low income are more likely to be uh, to react uh, to chemicals at lower levels than predicted uh, because of uh, psychosocial stress. This is also true of systemic racism. Uh, it's also true of um, uh, those little people, but, but 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 I don't do anything with children. Um, but you know, because children are different kinds of things. You know, they breathe more air, they drink more water, they behave like children, and um, you know, not like people. Um, so. Uh, I, I don't know how to handle um, children, so I, I stay away from children. Um, I do have a hobby of visiting schools that were built on dumps. Uh, how many of you have that hobby? Please raise your hand. Um, so I go around the country 
uh, visiting places built on dumps. Uh, Los Angeles, the school there, a uh, school built in Los Angeles. The um, uh, the um, in New Orleans, they have a um, uh, a school, and also in in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and they propose schools to be built on dumps in a number of places. But in my experience, um, only those that uh, were Black and Latino children are uh, the, the majority. Do they actually build the schools? Um, uh, and, you know, and so I, uh, you know, I try to address systemic racism. That's my forte. And it happens that, that schools are affected by systemic racism. Um, so that's my only interest in schools, uh, except that I also am on a, a committee on the indoor um, uh, environment uh, uh, and on school siting and on, um, but, but, but I'm only on there because of the systemic racism that's involved um, and the um, you know, you know, how can they cite those schools on 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 landfills? So, so that's my only interest in in, in that. It's not about children. Um, so, uh, and then I also work on dental amalgam. Now, uh, we were doing uh, work on. Uh, many of you may know that um, dental amalgam is fifty percent mercury. And that mercury contributes to is a as a potent neurotoxicant uh, contributes to things like ADHD um, uh, and learning disabilities. Uh, and that you know, and, and those are you know really important um, factors to to look at. And when we started looking at you know who gets dental amalgam and who doesn't, it seemed to be. Uh, people of color, but but the younger people of color, um, like below six years of age, and so I don't know whether those qualify as children, but um, uh, but I but I'm really concerned about uh, uh, people less uh, people getting dental amalgam uh, when they live in neighborhoods where they're already being exposed to mercury from trash incinerators, like uh, here in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, where I live, uh, and sewage sludge incinerators and other sources of mercury and the um, air pollution from uh, transportation, which contributes to neuro neurological effects and to uh, bug sprays and other neurotoxicants uh, all together that, that it's all the people are being the young people not I don't I don't do anything with children um, that young people um, are all being exposed to at the same time so um, so I want to uh, thank you and um, uh, and I feel um, privilege to have pull the wool over your eyes to make you think that I actually work with children uh, and do policy around children. And I want to thank my 91-year-old mother. Uh, I want to thank my um, late father. I want to thank my uh, my husband, my nieces and nephews um, uh, for, uh, and, you know, and I'm very concerned about the next generation. That's why I work in climate change. Uh, and um, glad that that you gave me this, even though I don't work with children. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, very creative. See that? See how he did that, y'all? <laughs> Mark, very well deserved. Thank you. And thank you for that various levels of alignment. Again, that will come up. I think that will be very well put for our discussion in a few minutes here. Ah, that's great. <laughs> So our next presentation does not happen every year, um, but we definitely felt it was deserving this year and it's to our sustainable business leader. So Eric Friedenwald Fishman is the creative director, founder and CEO of the Metropolitan Group, a firm that provides strategic and creative services to amplify the power of voices to change agents in, buildings, in building a just and sustainable world. Eric is a social impact pioneer he designs large narrative change. 
in innovations and public health and building public health will, building champions to drive changes in policy, practice, and expectations that advance this mission. Eric is the principal author of Metropolitan Group's Public Will Building Framework and co-author of Marketing That Matters, a book on socially responsible marketing published in five languages. I love that he volunteers for his local public schools, his congregation Beth Israel, and various arts and cultural organizations. And Eric, on behalf of the Children's Environmental Health Network, it is my honor to present you with our 2022 Child Health Advocate Award in Business. Thank you and well-deserved. Thank, thank you so much uh, to the Children's Environmental Health Network. Happy uh, Children's Environmental Health Day, everybody. To my fellow awardee panelists, what an incredible uh, group, of, group of people uh, who are doing amazing work. It was wonderful seeing uh, information about all of you in, in advance. And in particular for the community that this network uh, represents, you know, this community focuses the attention of the nation and drives impact on really the critical factor for our health, environmental impacts, which uh, absolutely is a critical impact on our health and attention on the people who are impacted the most. Um, as uh, Dr. Mitchell says, uh, though he doesn't work with children, is the children in our society who are impacted by our choices and often, particularly in their youngest years, do not have the access and agency to actually impact those, those choices that are having such an impact on them. So I'm accepting this award not as an individual business person, but really on behalf of our team, the client uh, networks that we work with, and the community partners who are the thought, thought and results leaders in this, in this work. I'm really fortunate at Metropolitan Group uh, that I work with a team that's really focused. 100% of our work is at the intersection of public health, environment, and social justice. And often those things get split apart in our society, but they are absolutely integrated. Uh, show me an environmental issue and I'll show you a social justice issue. Show me a health issue and I'll show you an environmental and a, ju and a justice issue. And I want to give some particular mention to Cyril Patel, who leads our environmental health team, to Vernice Miller-Travis, who leads our environmental justice team, and to Jennifer Messenger, who leads our public health team. Uh, these three leaders really are innovators in this space and champions uh, in this work, as well as the incredible uh, members of the teams they lead. But in particular, I want to thank the change agents, the folks that are in the movements that we serve, the nonprofits, the advocacy organizations, the student movements, the faith movements who come together and work on the front lines to put children's environmental health uh, at the center of the conversation. Now, our organization's work is supporting and building the capacity and designing these large scale social change campaigns with social justice movements. And we've been doing this for about 33 years. And we deeply believe that there are, while there's many ingredients to social change, there are two ingredients that absolutely have to be there for all social change. One of those is a change agent. If there isn't a person, an organization, a movement, a neighborhood that says this isn't okay, the status quo is not all right, people coming home with lead on their clothing is not okay, toxins in our environment, in fact, impacting our children and schools being cited on dumps are not okay, nothing changes. And the other ingredient is the power of voice. The only way change occurs is if you can activate other people. If that change agent had the power, they were an omnipotent being and could snap their fingers, the change would occur. But we have to get policymakers to move. We have to get others to advocate with us. And that comes from having the power of voice. And so that's the work that I get the absolute privilege to do is really working on ensuring the power of voice of change agents is amplified. And we really need to be deeply committed to focusing on addressing the conditions that impact children's health, because that's the key indicator for all of our health. Uh, that is, you know, if we're if we've got toxins in our environment that are impacting kids, it's ultimately impacting all, all of us. And it's all of our responsibility to do that work. Um, so we work on built environment uh, issues, we work on health equity and access issues, we work on food system issues, we work a lot on economic equity issues because there's not an accident that economic inequities always correlate with the location of both the toxins and the people who are exposed 
to the toxins. And I love that Dr. Mitchell brought up the critical importance on working on addressing structural racism, because at the core of these issues is structural racism. We designed it this way as a society. There, we didn't have to uh, have unmitigated toxins. We didn't have to put housing right where, the, where the toxins are. We didn't have to put incinerators in neighborhoods where people live. We designed it that way and made choices and those choices are justified based upon structural racism. So we get the incredible privilege of really working on climate justice and health, on working to deconstruct structural racism as a core impactor to health. And in particular in recent years on seeing how important it is to shift how progress is defined. Almost every government entity in the world defines progress based upon economic growth and beating others in competition. If we move that definition of progress to equitable well-being, how much equitable well-being does your city have? How much equitable well-being is there in the islands of Puerto Rico? How much equitable well-being is there for our tribal communities? We would make really, really different policy choices. And we're thrilled to be working with so many coalitions that are advocating to get that change in how we define progress in policy circles. I want to hit on three critical lessons that we've learned from communities as we've done this work. One is that narrative is a critical lever for change. Who shapes that upstream meta story? Who's centered in that story? Whose voices are amplified in that story? Shapes the way that we see issues. Shapes what, how we define the problem and what solutions we're willing to consider. Shapes what we even see as facts or not as, as truth. Two, voice isn't enough. We see so many places where there's engagement, where there's community advisory committees, where people are consulted, even where there's representation on policymaking uh, bodies, and that makes an impact. But if it's voice without teeth, if there isn't actually power to make decisions in the hands of the communities that are being impacted, we are missing the opportunity to drive truly transformative change. So it's imperative that we start building critical mass representation and voice with actual power and teeth. And three, false dichotomies are intentionally there to distract. We on this panel know there's no separation between environment and health, between justice and health, between equity and health, between sound environmental action and a healthy economy. But too often, policymakers invested interests who want to keep things the way they are frame these dichotomies so they can create fear that we will lose something. So they can instill a belief that it's not feasible to create the change that we are seeking. So they can stall or stop common sense changes to policy and practices. So calling out those false dichotomies and not letting them get in our way has been a critical lesson. In my last few moments, I want to focus on just a few things that we're seeing as critical needs and opportunities about children's health coming up. The first is we have to leverage the full implementation with the actual intent behind the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act. There are so many good things in those bills if they are centered on justice, if projects that are shovel worthy rather than just projects that are shovel ready get done, if we change the systems and structures of how money is distributed. But if we just do those programs the way they've been done in the past, if we repeat uh, the, the New Deal, if we repeat the post-World War II giant infrastructure buildup that did so much of the damage to, com to communities, we will have squandered an, an opportunity. It's going to take all of our advocacy and all of our voice to make sure these are implemented in the right way. Second, we have to deeply embed within the regulatory process and the culture of federal, state, and municipal agencies the changes that right now are being called forward. Right now we have an administration that's saying these things matter. Right now we have leaders that are saying these things matter. Right now we have policy that does. It won't always be the case. Uh, we have an election cycle coming up in a couple of weeks and another one in two years. So we have to embed deep the culture of saying we're gonna center people in community, the culture of saying we're gonna design money allocation processes that are driven by community and not full of bureaucracy. And three, we absolutely have to increase investment in the solutions that will actually address climate change and center the communities who are most impacted and that are not being funded right now. And by that, I mean, we, are, we have to invest in power building. 
we have to invest in electoral justice and actually getting the kind of voice with power that comes from electoral justice. And we have to invest in economic equity. I know that's not quote unquote a children's environmental health issue, but if we don't solve for that, we're not going to actually undo the impacts that are, are com coming at us. And finally, I just wanna hold up two things that I think we should be thinking about. Um, and one of them is eradicating lead in pre-1970s schools and housing. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Um, 1977, it was updated and became the Clean Water Act. And in 1978, we made lead paint illegal nationwide. So we're about 50 years from those actions of the 70s. We can and must, it's an imperative to say, we know where the pipes are. We know the housing stock that has the paint. We know, have the technology to fix it. We have the money to fix it. We don't have the will and have not forced doing it. Will we say by 2028, by 50 years from lead paint being made illegal in the United States, that no one will be lead poisoned? Because right now a half million kids a year are getting lead poisoned. And it feels to me that we are just a little ways away from the 50th anniversary of that. And we should be saying by the year 50, by gosh, it's well past time to get it done. And two, prioritizing delivery of clean drinking water in infrastructure to tribal communities and EJ communities. There are communities all over this country that do not have access to clean drinking water infrastructure. It's a fundamental health need. It particularly hits kids hard. Again, we know how to do it. We have the money to do it. What we don't have is the will because we have made these communities less important than others. And we have to change that. Again, I really deeply want to thank the Children's Environmental Health Network for the work you do every day. I want to thank my fellow panelists for the work you do every day. I want to thank everyone who's joining this call because you're all advocates. And I want to really deeply thank the partners in the community that we get the chance to work with, our families and our friends who stand up with us every day so we can do this work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric. And see, this is why we really made sure that this year <laughs> we made sure that uh, you, you received that that award. Your perspective, uh, you know, in this, and I would just say that, and we'll get into this more in the uh, in, the, in at the end here. But the economic pieces that you mentioned certainly are uh, connected to children, right? Because it's that it's that total disinvestment or lack of investment from these early early years, or even mom and dad before them, that show up in these generational ways. So. We can have that conversation for sure, but thank you for lifting up a lot of very important realities. Okay, another award that we decide on whether we give every year is our Arts and Media Award. So very excited that again, once again this year, we have we have a very strong candidate here. Uh, Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. is the president and founder of the Hip Hop Caucus. If you have not heard about or known or gone to the website or read about this amazing organization, please check them out. Their mission is to build a powerful and sustainable organization for the culture's role in civic process and empowerment of communities impacted first and worst by injustice. So you're seeing a lot of threads of connectivity right here among our award recipients. He's also the host of the award-winning climate and environmental justice podcast called The Coolest Show. He is a minister, a community advocate, and a US Air Force veteran, one of the most influential national leaders in the climate movement. Reverend Yearwood is a leader in campaigns calling for divestment from fossil fuels, causing climate change, increasing diversity in the climate movement, ensuring everyone has clean water and air and intentional efforts to address climate change. In 2018, he helped to launch Think 100%, Hip Hop Caucus's award-winning climate communications and activism platform, comprised of podcasts, film, music, and activism opportunities. The platform challenges environmental injustices and shares just solutions to the climate crisis, including a transition to 100% renewable energy for all. Revan Yearwood, it is completely my honor and on behalf of the Children's Environmental Health Network to present you with our 2022 Child Health Advocate Award in Arts and Media. Thank, thank you so much. And thank the Children's Environmental Health Network for this award that I will receive, but also will share with the Hip Hop Caucus, because could not do that without 
that powerful, amazing organization. So good and so honored to be with the other awardees, um, all of you. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I loved your speech. Um, definitely brought a smile to my face. And so good to be in community with you and everyone here. Um, you know, I received this honor as the president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus and a culture that will be 50 years next year that was started by young people and children in the Bronx, New York. And they started it using their cultural expression to shape their political experience. They started it because the Bronx Causeway was built through their community, causing redlining, causing poverty, causing homelessness, causing disease and sickness um, by living next to the highway. Um, and in their, in their struggle, they use their lyrics and their power to create something that now is international is across this globe. So if you want something powerful, have it start with children. Let children start your movement. Let children start whatever you're gonna do and it will be long lasting. That's the first thing I just wanna say. And in regards to this climate crisis that we're in, um, I am a minister, uh, went to Howard University, so I can get that shout out in right now. Howard University is Divinity School. And so one of the hardest things I've had to do in that capacity was to lay children to rest. There is nothing harder than when you see a children's casket. There is nothing harder when you see a baby's casket that is sometimes no bigger than a backpack or a suitcase. And when you're standing there and you realize that that child or that baby is dead primarily because of the greed of others, because someone's business plan meant a death sentence for that child, you realize that something is wrong in our society. When you're standing there and you realize that particularly in some communities, 68% of Black children live within 30 miles of a cold fire power plant, and those children are getting asthma and emphysema, their parents are getting cancer. Something is wrong. As Dr. Mitchell mentioned, when you have schools being built on dumps and toxic waste sites, and there are those who are sitting in boardrooms doing that on purpose and knowing the impacts, something is wrong. When you have children in Puerto Rico, and in Nigeria and in Pakistan, literally drowning and going underwater, taking their last breath because we are allowing fossil fuel companies to continue to heat up our planet and to rise our seas, something is, is wrong. When you have children in India who are trying to get away from the heat and in trying to get away from the heat in a drought latent area, they are drowning themselves in buckets because they want to stay underwater as long as they possibly can, then you know that something is wrong. And so we are in a crisis moment, not only from the climate aspect, but for humanity. We are not only dealing with equality, but we're also dealing with existence. And so this moment here is a moment for us to tell these stories. And so I want to say I'm so proud of all of the storytellers and all those who use narrative organizing. And I want to point this to the Hip Hop Caucus, who obviously uses this. And obviously, if you can go to Hip Hop Caucus, you can see they're working on democracy. They're working on climate change and environmental justice. They're working on civil and human rights. They're working on economic justice, they're working on all those things. But the key thing, is that their cultural organizing, their ability to work with and organize between 14 and 40 year olds who identify with the hip hop culture and share the values of justice and equity and to connect the hip hop community to the political process 
to build power and create change, then you understand that we can cultivate leaders from children to adults. Then you understand we can create platforms for cultural and grassroots leaders to use their voice, their creative talents, and their networks to educate, energize, and mobilize people and communities to create change. Then you understand that we can engage large and small audiences. We can foster and promote thought leadership. Then we can create change because we are living in a moment when we cannot have children laying in caskets, laying in boxes that are too small to even put in a hearse, too small to even put in the front of one's synagogue or one's mosque or one's church, too small because it's embarrassing when our children are dying because we will not transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. This is our moment right now. This is our lunch counter moment to stand up, to ensure that we can shape policy because for too long, policy has been shaping us. So thank you so much for this award. Thank you that I receive it along with the Hip Hop Caucus to continue to fight the good fight, to continue to push on so we can stop this trend of having children in small boxes, all power to the people. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think you got us all emotional for the best of reasons. We always say this, if you, it, it does not get more emotional than this, as you mentioned, uh, to be looking at any child suffering that had nothing to do, <laughs> nothing to do other than just be born into the circumstances that they were born into. So thank you. And I think it's uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, I call on a lot, who says that, you know, the, you can see the soul of a society by how it treats its children. And uh, I don't think he would give us a good <laughs> rating right now uh, in general. We, we haven't even lived up yet to our fullest potential to be that type of responsible agent, I think, uh, for the generations of today and tomorrow. So thank you, thank you. Congratulations. And congratulations. congratulations. And, and thank you to Hip Hop Caucus too. You know, the, the entire movement is, is truly transformative. So um, we all look forward to continuing to engage and partner. But sorry, Christy. That's okay. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no. Um, Again, yes, congratulations, Reverend Yearwood, and thank you so much for bringing the emotional heart to this conversation today. Um, you also sort of laid the foundation for this next award um, with your initial remarks on the power of youth leadership. So a very special Children's Health Advocate Award um, is actually designated for uh, young people aged 10 to 21. And uh, we are actually celebrating two of these awards today. Um, it's named after Inse Witherspoon. It's the um, Inseidu Obat Witherspoon or Now Youth Leadership Award. Um, and we're celebrating two awardees um, because they represent a powerhouse team. Um, and I'm really excited to present this award. So I'll introduce both uh, awardees now, starting with Ria Goswami and then um, both will provide the remarks. So Rhea is an Indian American climate activist studying electrical and computer engineering at Cornell University. Uh, she is the co-founder and executive director of the Environmental Justice Coalition, which is a national organization focusing on creating a pipeline of future climate activists, researchers, scientists, and community leaders. Rhea co-founded the organization to empower youth and magnify their voices in the environmental justice space. Some of her notable work in uh, her organization has been helping the producer of uh, the organization's original podcast, A Cup of EJ, working on original advocacy and policy at the state level, speaking to climate leaders and youth across the nation, and working on high school curriculum. Beyond her work in uh, the Environmental Justice Coalition, Rhea strives to use her science and technology knowledge to serve the greater good and make technologies smaller and faster to help undeserved, underserved communities. Next, we have Natasha Mata. Natasha is an incoming freshman at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, where she plans to study biopsychology, cognition, and neuroscience and public health. She is the co-founder and content director of the Environmental Justice Coalition. So you can see why these two are put together here. Uh, they're a strong team. 
Um, and again, the, the coalition aims to get generation Gen Z aware of and involved in the nationwide fight for intersectional environmental justice. Her interest in environmental justice was first sparked when she volunteered for an after school program in East Palo Alto, a city with a hospitalization rate for children aged zero to 14 so high that they created a dedicated asthma task force. She was struck by the stark contrast in environmental and socioeconomic conditions just nine miles away from where she lived. Outside of environmental advocacy, Natasha continues to center health equity and community empowerment. She works with the social media and adolescent health research team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is the editor-in-chief of Rediscover STEAM, which sheds light on the underrepresented uh, history of gender minorities in STEM, and the arts. And I just want to say, as a member of the American Public Health Association, um, I wanted to mention that uh, Rhea and Natasha have been instrumental in the development of and the promotion of a new climate and health um, high school lesson plan developed by APHA's environment section. Uh, their involvement ensured the centering of climate and environmental justice and youth perspectives um, in this lesson plan, which is going to be a critical piece of mobilizing public health professionals and youth alike um, as we work together to address climate change and children's health. So congratulations, Ria and Natasha. Um, and uh, we'll take comments from Ria first. Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you to all the awardees who are here and decide to finally meet you inside. Um, it's a huge honor to receive this award alongside my good friend and co-founder Natasha, and it's also so inspirational to be surrounded by amazing panelists and to hear everyone's stories, because that's how we grow as humans and as activists as well. So thank you everyone to, for sharing your stories and being here today. I'd also like to thank a lot of all of my mentors, colleagues, and friends that have made this me receiving this award possible. I'd also like to take a moment to shout out my dad, because without him, I wouldn't have begun to discover my love for politics and activism. And he always told me to stand up for what I believed is right. So thank you so much. I would also like to thank the Children's Environmental Health Network for giving me a platform and giving a platform to use like me and Natasha. But I would also like to recognize our team because without them, we would not be here and we would not be able to do a lot of the projects that we do. So in Natasha's bio, she kind of spoke a little bit about why she got into environmental justice. So I'd like to do the same. So throughout high school, I really was interested in biology and I was also an avid debater. And then the pandemic all of a sudden hit in our sophomore year of high school. Then the pandemic granted us, um, a lot of these students, a unique amount of time and an unprecedented amount of time to explore a lot of new things. So this is where I really discovered my love for activism and youth empowerment as well. And this is through like Michelle Obama's organization, like When We All Vote, as well as youth policy making organizations that was founded within my area, like the Greater Good Initiative that focused on youth policy making. And these organizations gave me a deeper understanding into what application of debate skills can look like. And it was actually through these organizations that I'd met Natasha. And but in this, I was looking for something a little bit more to unite my love for social justice and biology. And that's really where I found environmental justice as my calling, as cliche as it sounds. And I really found it as my passion when I was attending the high school leaders program um, at UVA at the Sorensen Institute. And I heard some of my classmates talk about how they're impacted by the rising tides in Southern Virginia. And also hearing directly from indigenous leaders in Virginia about chemicals and their land really empowered me to start looking into solutions. Um, that's how we kind of co-founded EJC. So why Natasha and I founded EJC, co-founded EJC was really because of the lack of youth voices with in the environmental justice space. And as Reverend Yearwood um, highlighted, being able to harness collaborations between communities and youth is a really unique thing. And that often produces amazing solutions like Christy had um, explained with the APHA curriculum. And why are youth so important in the first place? Because youth have a really unique perspective perspective, as well as scales such as social media to contribute to the fighting of environmental issues, as well as the fact that they live through these experiences, they live in these communities as well, and that, that they're more often invigorated to fight against these issues. And also, youth are the change maker scientists and advocates of tomorrow, so they need to be trained in these issues as well as be empowered to fight against these issues. 
So some of the work that we do at EJC is like we have our own original podcast where we talk to various people within the environmental movement and the climate change movement. Some of the people we've talked to is like our dear mentor, Dr. Megan Lashaw. We've also talked to grassroots organizers like um, Diamond Spratling in Atlanta. We've also talked to a NASA scientist, Dr. Patrick Taylor, the Langley um, Research Center, who focuses on Arctic um, climate research. So we really try to highlight all the various aspects like we can see on this panel today of how people can approach climate justice and give to youth that you don't, you don't have to just be an activist in one way. And there's so many different ways you can approach the climate change movement. As well as we've worked directly with the Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights, which recognizes the fact that a healthy environment is a human right for your future and um, future generations as well as current children right now. So we helped create advocacy toolkits for that as well as we worked on school curriculum specifically we have worked um, with Baltimore County schools to talk about transport equity as well as the effect of pollution on students. And lastly, we worked on op-eds which highlight the importance of environmental justice and climate literacy among children. The hopes for our organization in the future are we hope to expand our organization and be able to share a voice like we are now in our story on various different platforms, as well as hear other diverse stories on our Thor podcast and meeting different people. We hope to work a lot more with rural communities, as well as enact more policies and work more with state legislators. But beyond that, with our hopes for like at least my hopes for the environmental movement is to have um, local organizers and communities recognized for their efforts for fighting against institutionalized racism as well as environmental justice, fighting for environmental justice, seeing more student-led efforts and empowerment um, towards solutions that are thought of by students, and seeing more climate science curriculums in schools for all grade levels. So those are just some of the things that I would love to see. But thank you so much for awarding me with this award, and it's a great honor to be on this panel. Thank you so much, Ria. Uh, Natasha. Um, yeah, first off, I just wanted to thank Christy and Zay and just the Children Environmental Health Network as a whole um, for honoring Ria and me with this award and also say congratulations to all of the other attendees. It's been so inspiring to hear about your work um, and all of your personal stories. Um, like Dr. Mitchell, our work focuses more so on environmental justice and children. I think our main connection to children is that we were children before Ria's 18th birthday earlier this week, but nevertheless, we are so humbled and honored to be here. Um, so I wanted to take this time to share more about my interest in environmental justice and also the work that we're doing at the Environmental Justice Co Coalition. So as Christy mentioned in my introduction, my interest in environmental justice uh, was largely sparked when I volunteered for an after-school program in East Palo Alto my freshman year of high school. Um, and that city had super high rates of childhood asthma and a dedicated asthma task force. And I saw how environmental and climate issues affect children even before they're born. And that, you know, there's they didn't have any kind of fall in these um, issues happening to them. And then I also learned about other environmental justice issues in the Bay Area, such as air pollution from oil refineries and other toxic emission sites, um, worsening childhood asthma in the area, and with especially Black and Indigenous children being disproportionately affected. Um, so then fast forward to my junior year, um, I met Rhea volunteering for an organization focused on the intersection of technology and social justice. And as we got to know each other better over the coming months, uh, we discovered our mutual interest in environmental issues, which then brought us to environmental justice. And then finally, we decided to found the Environmental Justice Coalition to get people in our generation, so Generation Z, aware of and involved in, in environmental justice efforts. I think while most of people have at least heard of climate change, many do not know about environmental justice, although it's also extremely important. And we wanted to shed light on how environmental issues disproportionately affect BIPOC and low-income communities, as well as highlight the need for diverse voices and conversations about climate, environment, climate and environmental issues, like Rhea mentioned, kind of the importance of youth voices in these conversations. So about our work at EJC, um, I'm currently serving as the content director, so I'm managing social media platforms, primarily Instagram, writing and editing for our publication, and also managing social media-based partnerships. 
So we have several ongoing projects um, focused on like representation and empowerment and also just educating and making um, environmental justice topics more accessible. So we have a few different kind of series of posts. So we have hidden figures of the environmental movement, which is highlighting the stories of women that are breaking barriers and enacting change within environmental issues. Um, we're about to start the ABCs of environmental justice, which will be breaking down terms like environmental racism so that environmental justice topics are accessible to anyone. And also good climate news where we're rounding up good news in climate and environmental justice in the past month um, to make sure that we're kind of fighting that climate doomism. And then we also post toolkits which explain environmental legislation and also provide simple ways for people to take action like phone or email templates to contact a senator or representative that way people that don't have as much political knowledge or background can still be involved in helping advocate for these issues and through ejc we've also had the opportunity to collaborate with the apha and jhu on the curriculum on climate change and human health for high school students across the country, which was a super exciting opportunity. And we've also worked with Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights and the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, like Rhea mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to end by thanking um, some of the people who helped me and Rhea get here today. Um, so I wanted to thank Dr. Megan Lotcha from Johns Hopkins University. Um, she took Rhea and I on as mentees pretty early on in our journey, and it was really empowering. Um, that she saw potential in us even and our idea, even though we were just high school students and kind of just dipping our toes in environmental justice work. And she's opened so many doors and given us so many opportunities like bringing the Children's Environmental Health Network to our attention. Um, I wanted to thank my teachers who went out of their way to educate me on climate change issues, even when they were not included our, in our curriculums, which definitely helped kind of um, spark my interest throughout the rest of high school. Um, I also wanted to thank Rhea <laughs> for being um, so hardworking, always bringing new ideas to the table, and for being so supportive despite us being on the opposite side of the country. I guess we're middle and side now. <laughs> and then um, finally, I just wanted to thank the rest of the EJC team for helping us bring our idea to life. Thank you, Rhea and Natasha. Thank you both for who you are individually, but of course, who you are together uh, and, and both of your stories. And I appreciate the emphasis on storytelling and mentorship and giving folks a chance and being heard and hearing others. I mean, all of these are just life lessons for all of us, no matter what age, right? And we will see, uh, no doubt, uh, effective, positive change, transformational change, if we can allow ourselves to just you know, walk these journeys and not get in our own way, as my grandmother would always say. All right, well, thank you. I do want to acknowledge Jade Begay, uh, who apparently was not able to, maybe she will still join us, but um, we do want to at least acknowledge her. Uh, she was also our community award recipient this year. Uh, if you don't know, Jade Begay uh, is uh, with the NDN Collaborative, uh, collect, Collective, excuse me, and she's the Climate Justice Campaign Director. And they're an organization dedicated to building indigenous power. And she uses her extensive experience as a film director, multimedia producer, narrative and communication strategist, climate and indigenous rights activist and writer and facilitator, and a trainer uh, in diversity and inclusion work to support amplification of First Nation and marginalized people's voices and movements and to restore ecological balance and protect indigenous culture. So I just wanted to bring Jade into this, um, this room. She's, you know, busy uh, fighting the fight and doing her incredible work. And we're just sorry we missed her during this time period, but we'll definitely make sure that uh, maybe we'll do a, a, a quick video with her uh, so we can at least get her on, on record for everyone to hear as well some of her thoughts. But so let's use our last 20 minutes or so here and uh, get into some discussion uh, with our incredible thought leaders. So each of you work towards improving children's environmental health, even, even though uh, Dr. Mitchell says we may not have those connections, but we actually do um, in more ways than one. And especially health equity through different practices. So whether it's medicine, health professional, research, community activism, arts and media, business um, angles uh, with youth leaders, no matter what it is, communications, uh, you all come to this work from diverse experiences and who you are, the work you're leveraging and doing, as well as maybe the affiliated programs you work with. So given that reality and given your unique experiences and expertise, 
How do you feel about the, the confluence of today's significant intersectional issues like COVID-19, pandemic, worldwide pandemic, which is still here, uh, climate change, you know, environmental racism, you know, et cetera. I mean, all of these on their own, as we all know, are incredibly um, impactful. And yet the confounding impact, especially for our most vulnerable, our youngest, um, is, is completely, it can be completely overwhelming. Uh, so who would like to start? I mean, as far as those of us out here working in this advocacy arena, the challenges we know are many. We've, we've heard many of them in the last hour. We know that, right? Um, but how, how do we collectively uh, consider these intersectional issues in an effective way so that we can not get bogged down, but continue that work uh, forward, the urgent work that we need to move forward? Well, I'm going to make a comment <laughs> because there was Please. a long silence. I don't like long silences. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, when I, I remember when, when the pandemic started and we were locked down in Puerto Rico and there was all this confusion and, and our PRAP chapter was trying to support pediatricians in their roles when we didn't know anything. And then all the you know data kept coming and things kept changing and guidelines kept being updated every day. That chaos reminded me so much about um, after Hurricane Maria in 2017. So it's when I realized, you know, we're, we're seeing the same problems over again with this new crisis. And then again, um, with the earthquakes that we had a month before the pan we had the lockdown, we had a, a, you know, an earthquake sequence that never ended. It was on and on and on in the southern part of the island. But it was felt throughout the, the 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 whole island archipelago, and and I remember again, you know, the same problems over and over. Children were more vulnerable, uh, marginalized communities were more impacted, and same thing. We we didn't have enough access to to healthcare and access to water, safe water, and access to food, and so and education and everything got paralyzed again and again for five years and. So if the, if the problems have so many common denominators, then the solutions must also be, you know, similar. And so I, I believe that all the work that we're doing and all, and all the work that many people are doing that we don't, we don't know of, and that's the thing we need to communicate better, um, all of it will compound and, and get us to a solution. But at the end, I believe that those who have the power to make decisions and to assign funding for things, they are the ones that can really, really at the end, make the, the things that we know need to be made at this point. Yeah, if I can step in, uh, I absolutely agree with Dr. Huertas. Um, and, um, you know, when we look at climate change, um, we, in order to address climate change, we have to address many, many different uh, things. We need to change many systems. Um, we need to uh, change the way we look at environment. We need to uh, change um, our financing. We need to be able to respond to uh, disasters like hurricanes. Um, uh, so we need to change our public health system. We need to change. Um, and, uh, it, and it turns out we need to change all of our systems. Uh, and the same thing if we want to address racism, uh, we need to change um, uh, all of these systems. We need to change our health system uh, to make it uh, more accessible we, uh, and more resilient. Uh, and we need to change uh, and, and to make sure that it's uh, fair and that people have access uh, to it, uh, no matter what their income, and that the quality of the health is the same for people um, at, at various income levels and wherever they live. Um, we need to uh, change uh, the banking system. We need so this is an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to address um, uh, racism while addressing uh, children's health. Um, uh, I do admit there is a such thing as children's health, uh, and uh, to uh, address climate um, at the same time. We we have to change all of these, but unless we and you know we don't need to leave anybody behind. Um, 
uh, things can improve for everybody. It's not an either or, it's not a limited pie. That's like saying, you know, there were always predictions that that um, that the earth would run out of food uh, and that there were too many people on the earth. Uh, and there were uh, a number of uh, scientific estimates as to when uh, the mass starvations would would start in the you know in the 1600s and the 1800s, uh, but things changed. Uh, the pie got got bigger. Uh, we decided that we wanted to focus on producing more food, uh, so that now we have enough food to feed the the globe. Uh, but we just uh, so. That's no longer the, the issue. The issue is distributing it to the globe uh, and sure that, that people who are uh, low income uh, get uh, access to high quality food. Uh, all of that is possible as long as we have the political will to do it. Uh, things can get better for everyone. Uh, things, you know, we can address uh, child uh, health and child poverty uh, and um, and uh, climate change. Um, uh, and we can do it in a way, uh, as the young people say, the intersectional way, uh, in intersectionally, uh, to address all of those things at the same time. And we really do need to do that. Yeah, I want to piggyback on Dr. Mitchell's last point there on, on how we need to create an intersectional environmental movement. Um, I think one of the things for me is that I've seen a trend, particularly as I work with a lot of people uh, and definitely young people with the Hip Hop Caucus, is that they are even moving from the terminology of just uh, environmental justice to environmental liberation and looking at it from the lens of how climate justice is racial justice and racial justice is climate justice, but so is queer justice and housing justice and obviously health justice. Um, so all these things are, are connected in, in that regard. I, I would say though, that I do think that we heard earlier that obviously democracy is a key component here. And that's one of the things that we must begin, we must again, look at very carefully um, to how we are pushing uh, democracy and shaping policy. Um, but I think the one thing for us as a movement, and I will say this, I wanna make sure to get this in, I do think we're at a movement, we're at a moment for our movement as well. Um, that I think that our movement is looking and needing. I believe that not only will this movement be better by having more young people and children in key positions. And what I mean by that, I mean like smashing the kitty table mentality. I'm not trying to give your people this a table in the corner so they can feel good about it. But I mean, really giving them resources and, and infrastructure and funding so they can lead, they can win or they can fail, but they will then be at the center. It's a different situation when you literally make a decision. I also believe, to be honest, that this movement will be successful as a BIWAC leaderful movement, meaning a black, brown, indigenous woman, woman of color, a uh, leaderful movement that when women, to be honest, are leading this movement, we're going to be a much better position. Um, and I think that that's, to me, one of the key things that we need to do. And I would just finally just say in all of this, I think that movement that talks a lot about equity, um, but we, we sometimes don't show the equity ourselves within this movement. And so I just want to say that we are calling for a Justice 40 throughout, for instance, the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act or the BIF or whatever the policies are coming, that we also need to have a Justice 40 within our own movement. Um, you know, recently um, surveys have gone up from Green 2.0 and also from the New School that said that, um, for instance, out of the 12 largest funders, who are giving resources to this movement, they gave $1.3 billion out of those 12 funders, putting them on climate. But out of that, only 1.3% went to EJ and BIPOC organizations. From the larger, actually, climate movement, it's actually almost down to 0.8%. So if you only have 0.8% or 1.3% of your funding going to Black, Brown, Indigenous, women, queer, uh, women of color led organizations, 
you're not going to be successful. Um, so I do think that we need to have some real, this is a moment for some real conversations to build that intersectional movement, to break down those silos, but to get real about how we got here through privilege and white supremacy and how we can now create a new movement that can be powerful, that is led by women, women of color, black and brown communities to push us into the 21st century. Yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. I haven't heard that articulated in that way, Reverend Yearwood. So I will mm -hmm. say, I will meditate on that. <laughs> Many of us out here believe some of the same, but we will meditate on that. <laughs> no, thank you. Any others on this? I do have at least one more, maybe we can get through uh, before we wrap up and give everyone back their days here. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in really quickly on what um, Reverend Yearwood was highlighting, especially about the youth aspect and the BIPOC aspect. I think as being like EJCs, basically both of those and women love um, as well, I think it's really important to get funding is what we've also realized. But I think also from the children's aspect and youth aspect, as Natasha highlighted within her like introduction, climate change and climate science isn't taught as well as it should be in schools. And I think it's really important, like this is a really important moment. I think that's why the APHA curriculum as well is very important. It's like, this is the moment to highlight as well, the lack of information and the lack of education around climate change. Like we talk about all these big terms. We talk about environmental justice. We talk about intersectionality. We talk about these like big terms like carbon neutrality, 2050. But as youth, sometimes we don't know what that means. These are all like big terms or big heavy terms with a lot of history. And I think it's very important that youth are educated about the full holistic history and not just aspects and like cherry picking parts of information that people want to hear within the movement or people want to accept within the movement. So that's why I think it's really important for again, community educators as well as people who have lived through these experiences to come forward, share their stories. Again, as um, Nisei highlighted, like the importance of storytelling and um, especially as activists, storytelling is one of the most powerful tools we have to leverage change. Um, I know one of the panelists mentioned that, um, or I think it was Nisei, I don't know. But anyways, storytelling is very important. I think that's why um, we really do need to up the education as well for youth. Because I've talked to a lot of youth and I've talked to a lot of youth activists. We all kind of got into this movement from our own interests and not necessarily like teachers push us in the right direction or the education, the public education system pushes in the right direction. So I think really there also needs to be an effort from educators as well as people who make these curriculums to incorporate climate change as is a issue that we are now facing in our day-to-day -day lives and seeing so many people impacted by it. Thank you so much, Ria. So we have, I think at different iterations uh, of this conversation today, acknowledge that we are living in unique times. This administration, uh, Congress has been busy also, infrastructure legislation, the IRA, new climate change, uh, you know, levels of capacity, the EJ office in the Health and Human Services, a new EJ and Civil Rights Office Director at EPA, the Office of Child Health Protection, by the way, EPA is looking for a viable director. I know many of us care very much about who will take on that position. That is a, it's a smaller office, but it's such a vital office with a mission to ensure that all of our federal government <laughs> is putting children first. And I think we could all say that is yet to happen uh, in all related initiatives. So we could go on and on. Those are just some of the initial heavy hitters, Justice 40, the Environmental Justice Scorecard. There's a lot, right? We're not a huge organization. We are mighty because of our partners, I say often, right? We are stronger together. That's what this day is about, to leverage, to support, to enlighten, to learn from, uh, to, to grow. Um, what would be one effective strategy that you would all prioritize for us as an organization, our network, partners who, again, as Dr. Mitchell said earlier, actually do care about children and want to uh, work on making this world a better place. Out of all happening, right, and, and a lot of people behind the scenes and making a lot of those successes to date happen, moving forward, where might we prioritize? Because we do have to prioritize capacity, energy, attention. We appreciate your recommendations. Well, I must say, uh, um, when you're thinking about ideas to, to, to continue advancing your work, um, we, we should always keep in mind um, pediatricians. Uh, pediatricians see uh, kids, you know, we, we evaluate even before the baby is born with that prenatal visit with the families. 
So we get to know this family in, at a personal level. And we get to know that child at a very personal level, level throughout the life, prenatally, and then all the way up to 21 years. So they trust us. Our families trust pediatricians. And if we are more educated, we continue investing on increasing pediatricians' capacity to deal with environmental health issues. If we continue um, educating, um, as um, I think Natasha mentioned, um, you know, educating the youth, but then also educating the healthcare professionals, in particular pediatricians, because of our role in, in children's life, um, because we're the experts in children's health. Um, I think you're going to have more outreach. You're going to you're going to get the message through, and we're going to change that. You know, um, culture in medicine about um, you know what it's important. We we really need to understand that um, we've mentioned equity many times. Um, when we see things like in Puerto Rico, um, we receive three thousand dollars less per person per year from of Medicaid funding as compared to the poorest state in the United States. And yet we're, our children are American citizens. That's not acceptable. Um, so how can we ask our clinicians to screen for environmental health, to use an environmental health questionnaire, to do all these preventive stuff that are not gonna be reimbursed? Um, so we're losing our um, healthcare force that continues emigrating. And so you see how these problems of, you know, lack of equity and disparities, you know, ha have an impact on, on all this problematic and how we can have, be more effective. So I, I believe that having the, um, you know, the healthcare force in mind and how we can collaborate, um, I think it's, it's an important, it's an important thing. Thank you. And that's how the network got started 30 years ago. It was starting with the, uh, the impetus of healthcare professionals who were starting to see their patients um, and things not happening that were correct um, in their otherwise healthy patients, right? Absolutely. I want to raise up uh, something that in your, your world was um, hitting on pretty hard. Um, so I'm one of those people that I have, always have a hard time saying, what's the one thing you, sh you should do? Um, but, and, and, and I've got a nice list of three, but I'm gonna tell you the one, uh, which is, we have to, and it's not gonna be this movement alone, but we have to invest in really looking at power building and transformation within our own electoral structure. You know, we, women's political participation and leadership in the United States is nowhere near at, at Perry. It's not even in the universe. Black, indigenous, Latino representation with power in our political decision-making bodies is absolutely not where it needs to be. And that is all purposeful and it's structures. We have a structure right now where the Senate um, is 50-50 split, but the difference about who's actually represented, the 50% of Democratic senators represent almost a third more folks, but don't have the power of the votes to bring legislation forward. So we've got to do some real structural work in our overall political system because the fact of the greed that Dr. Uh, that Re Reverend Yearwood was talking about, you know, we don't have to have laws in our country that say there's no limit on pay differential. We don't have to have uh, laws in our country that say your accounting, generally accepted accounting principles that your corporation must follow, do not have to factor in any of your environmental costs or any of your uh, impacts on, on community. Uh, there are so many ways that we could be addressing these fundamental issues. And, you know, a couple of people today have talked about with a lack of political will. It is the lack of political will, but it's not a lack of political will on the P of the people. Most people want their kids to be healthy. Most people believe in a sense of fairness, but we have a structure that was designed that is keeping us from exercising that will. So it's about political will at the top. And that's a big lift, but we don't invest in our movements in that long game. We have, and the places we have in the past have made huge benefits. Um, we've just seen this giant change in the court. That was 50 years of orchestration and work to create absolute power. Uh, that's going to be really damaging for a lot of things I think the people in this network care about. 
we got to we got to push push the opposite. Uh, I I believe that those of us on this call who are not winning the youth award owe it to the two people and everyone else of their generation who's winning that youth award to say when you actually meet the constitutional requirement to be able to run for president when you're 35, there will not be an electoral college. There will be a vote, that there will be ranked choice voting, that there will be open primaries, that all of those barriers to having actual representation with power will be changed because I honestly think if the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress and city councils and state legislatures looked like this call, where I'm the minority on the call, we'd have really different decisions being made and we wouldn't be talking about a lack of, public, of political will. Eric, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to start to close us out. Again, Christy and I, the Children's Environmental Health Network cannot extend any more our positive energy, our, our excitement for all of you and what you do. And we know that you don't do this for accolades. We know that, but we also feel it's really, really important to take stock, to take a step back. That's what this day is about and just acknowledge each other. You know, So we just wanna um, to mention that uh, and, and just from what I heard anyway, doc, I'll, I'll, I mean, we have a whole list of notes, thank you, but Dr. Huerta Montaña uh, reminded us to take stock of our surroundings and extending gratitude for the opportunity and need for all of us to stop and reflect so that we can be stronger and more effective advocates and not burn out. Uh, she also pointed out that the benefits of science emerge when the lives of people are made better. And we also heard from Dr. Mark Mitchell, uh, remembering when Children's Environmental Health Network was created 30 years ago, his passion for environmental justice and marginalized communities and using a very creative way of helping us all see that no matter where you think you sit in this field of advocacy, environmental justice, conservation, what have you, they all lead back to children, vulnerable populations. I mean, you can't avoid it. It's there, it's very naturally intertwined. And I do believe that is in design. Uh, Eric ensuring, uh, reminded us to ensure that the power of the voice is amplified and that that is a key indicator that when move, move, excuse me, movement forward uh, will happen and eventually actually help the most at risk when you're shouldering uh, and, and considering and breaking the realities of environmental racism at its core as the system that is intentionally that of which we are growing in, working in, you know, working in right now, that this was not by accident, this is by design. So our way of approaching it and the solution oriented ways that we're coming together in partnership must recognize that design and that there are lessons learned from communities all over the world that narratives critically shape our solutions. Voice isn't enough if it's not com combined with transformation change pathways and false dichotomies that are purposefully set up to instill that another way is not possible. And then Reverend Yearwood, uh, very passionate, amazing, uh, as usual points, reminding us that the 50th anniversary of the hip hop culture that started in the Bronx um, is gonna be just a year from now where the use of lyr lyrics has been elevated to harness power, especially among our young folks. And if you want something powerful, then let children and our youth start it and grow it as a movement, we will see evidence of fruits of that labor. He spoke about how someone's business can actually, uh, and plan can actually cause children around the world to suffer. And that 68% of black, brown, indigenous children live near a coal fire power plant. This is not okay, since when is this ever okay? We need to tap into natural talents to create change. This is our lunch counter moment, I love that, to ensure that we can shape policy rather than it shaping us. Ria and Natasha, I cannot be more proud and humbled to have yet another uh, group now of alumni joining our many years of now award recipients. You make me so proud. I continue, I'm, I'm so in, uh, in excited like everyone to learn from and watch you grow and to partner with you. Ria, you reminded us that growing as humans and activists is what happens when we genuinely tell our stories, when we allow ourselves to be human with each other. Being able to share on various platforms is also an opportunity to advance the needs ahead. And Natasha, you spoke on the impacts of climate and environmental justice issues that are having upon children even before they are born into this world, right? And the level of reality that that is and the importance of youth engagement and leadership in communities all over. So I could go on and on. Those are just some of the highlights that are resonating with me. I encourage everyone to take, take a walk, <laughs> do whatever it is that you can just to have a moment out of this very deep but important and vital conversation 
Um, it's an honor to have had this with you. I, I'm going into a board meeting on Monday and a gala tomorrow, and I'm uh, thoroughly energized uh, more than ever and appreciate you all for helping with that. Um, Christy, would you like to say anything? <laughs> Uh, just thank you and congratulations to uh, the awardees for all of your incredible, inspiring, tireless leadership in making our relationship with the earth and especially with each other better, more equitable, and more nurturing for our children. 